All right, well, why don't we get started? Um, first of all, thanks for everyone for joining tonight. I know it's a beautiful evening, at least in, in Hanover. Uh, so appreciate you spending some time with us um, for this very interesting event we have uh, on free trade with Steve Hankey and David Otter. So my name is Joe Glado, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Tuck chapter of the Adam Smith Society, along with my Caleb or my colleague, uh, Caleb Dorfman, who will help uh, moderate tonight's discussion. And we'd also like to extend a welcome to the folks uh, at the Cornell Johnson School, uh, who are also joining us uh, tonight. So we're privileged to be joined by two esteemed scholars on trade and two scholars we expect will agree on many issues surrounding trade and also disagree on many others. So on the one side, we have Steve Hankey, who is a leading world expert on currency boards, measuring and stopping hyperinflation, privatization, currency, and commodity trading, as well as water resource economics and a myriad of other topics. Steve is a professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at Johns Hopkins University, and is also co-founder and co-director of the Institute for Applied Economics Global Health and the Study of Business Enterprise is an interdivisional institute between the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences and the Whitting School of Engineering. Our other guest, David Otter, is the Ford Professor in the MIT Department of Economics and also co-director of the NBER Labor Studies Program. Uh, and he's also a co-leader of both the MIT work of the Future Task Force and the JPAL Work of the Future Experimental Institute. His scholarship explores the labor market impacts of technological change and globalization on job polarization, skill demands, earning levels, and inequality, and electoral outcomes. And in 2017, Otter was rec recognized by Bloomberg as one of the 50 people, top 50 people who defined global business. So at this point, I will turn it over and introduce my co-chair, Caleb Dorfman, who will help uh, moderate tonight's event and get our discussion going. Great, thanks, Joe. Like Joe, I'm very excited to have this discussion. Obviously, global trade has been a very hot topic in recent years, and I think that we have a great panel uh, assembled. I know here at Tuck, uh, David's work actually features prominently in some of our courses and actually in one class that I took um, earlier this year, we devoted a single whole class session to your work. So I'm happy to able uh, that we're gonna hear from you directly. I think that obviously you and Steve have slightly different views on trade, but I think that for the audience to really get a good background and understanding of where you really sit, it would be nice if each of you could make maybe a two minute and opening statement capturing the high level views of what Steve, you view as the benefits of free trade and David, some of the negative consequences that you think we need to think about from your research. So David, do you wanna go first? Uh, sure, I'm happy to go first. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks Steve uh, for, for making time as well. So, um, you know, we have known since uh, David Ricardo, the great Portuguese British Jewish uh, trade economist uh, that free trade among consenting nations uh, raises GDP in all of them. Uh, and that if you take an undergraduate economics class, uh, you will learn that lesson. Um, we have known uh, since uh, a paper by Stolper Samuelson uh, in the 1940s that free trade also is redistributive and that in general, free trade although it raises GDP in a nation, it will make some citizens worse off in absolute terms uh, because it, if a trade works by changing prices, uh, raising some and lowering others, and those price changes feed through to wages. And in general, uh, they, uh, uh, there will be winners and losers from trade. Um, we also know, and I'm gonna stop on what we also know uh, in a second, that you know, the, the, because the pie is growing, it's possible to reallocate the slices so that everyone gets a larger slice, although in practice that doesn't tend to happen. These lessons are well understood. However, they were largely forgotten uh, by trade policy advice uh, to politicians uh, who were told by economists uh, that trade was a win-win. Uh, it made everybody better off. 
uh, it would usher in you know, growth and prosperity and opportunity and rising incomes and no other compensatory uh, policy or uh, 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 adjustment policy was needed. And that advice was wrong. Uh, and uh, it was spectacularly wrong when it came to China's accession to the WTO in 2001. Um, when China joined the World Trade Organization, China's uh, exports to the United States and the US uh, trade deficit as share of GDP rose to about 3%, which is enormous. Uh, US manufacturing employment uh, fell by 20% uh, between uh, 1999 and 2007. That was before the Great Recession. And that was unprecedented. Um, and I, when you actually look at the number of jobs that were affected, it's not that large. Uh, it's a couple of million jobs in a labor market of 150 million people. So it doesn't sound like a big deal. But of course, manufacturing is highly, highly localized. Manufacturing is not like hospitals and drug stores where you find one in every community. Uh, manufacturing where it occurs, it occurs uh, in a focal way on a few products. And in those manufacturing intensive communities, when uh, China joined the WTO, there were very rapid job losses as uh, you know, factories and entire industries shuttered. And it turned out people did not adjust successfully to that. Uh, there was very large drops in employment, uh, rise in poverty, a lot of other social maladies that go along with that. And to a lot of people's surprise, including my own, uh, people did not move around to new opportunities. And so we saw a lot of growth of concentrated poverty. Um, this is not a failure of trade. This is a failure of domestic policy. And uh, we cannot have globalization on the cheap and expect it to work well. Uh, I'm not opposed to globalization at all. And in fact, China's rise has brought, you know, 400 million Chinese out of poverty, has created prosperity and growth throughout Central and South America, has created investment in Sub-Saharan Africa where it was not occurring. It has been the best thing for the world middle class in, you know, probably forever, certainly in the last millennium. Uh, it's created many benefits. However, uh, it's a uh, fallacy and one that is, you know, logically disprovable to believe that uh, it benefits everyone. And if a country like the United States wants to make rapid changes in trade policy that are going to be disruptive for large numbers of workers, it should adopt policies to uh, help people adjust successfully uh, so that that is uh, less scarring and less costly. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. So obviously, Steve, you are a large proponent of free trade and uh, like to focus on the benefits of trade. Can you maybe take two or three minutes and talk, frame your views on what are the larger benefits that you see from free trade? Okay, Caleb, uh, thank you. I, I Actually, given your family name, before we get started, I assume you're not related to Robert Dorfman, professor of economics at Harvard, Long ago, I, I cut my eye teeth on a lot of Dorfman's work in water resource economics, which Joe had mentioned. That was an area of my interest. But at any rate, uh, be that as it may, uh, let, let me make a few remarks since we're in the Adam Smith Society about Adam Smith and, and what Smith's views were. First of all, uh, he was born in Kirkcaldy in 1723 in Scotland, that is. And he moseyed down to Oxford uh, and he was there from 1740 to 1747 in, in which he wrote even the pretense of teaching had been lost by the time he went to Oxford. Uh, he then uh, assumed a chair in moral philosophy at Glasgow in 1752. And in 1759, he wrote his, in a way, maybe his most significant work is actually the theory of moral sentiments. Uh, right after he wrote that, and he went to France for two years with the Duke of Buckley. Uh, that was in 1764. And then, of course, the big one, The Wealth of Nations in 1776. And although that book and Smith are noted uh, and associated with the, the phrase laissez-faire, uh, laissez-faire, laissez-passe actually. Uh, he actually was a proponent of, of many aspects of government. One was the provision of defense 
to the provision of, of some uh, public works uh, and also justice, the establishment and enforcement of laws. Now, when it, when it comes to free trade or trade in general, he took a very much a classical liberal point of view. And that is uh, if voluntary exchange takes place between two parties, a buyer and a seller, uh, unless some laws are broken or third parties specifically damaged, uh, that's, that's all to the good. So that, that was his position. Now, with regard to trade policy in the United States, the, the big problem is uh, for people who advocate a laissez-faire policy, which would be some, someone like me, I, I'm, I'm really a, a unilateral free trade type in, in my general position. But this is a very minority uh, kind of viewpoint. The, the public at large does not accept that position. And the reason that they don't, one thing that, that skews the whole picture, in addition to what David mentioned, these, these local disruptions, shall we say, that, that's one obvious thing, local. But the big picture and, and the reason that free trade has a, shall we say, negative point of view is that we have a negative balance in our trade account or current account. This, this is the, the big problem and the big thing that colors all political debate. And we've had that negative balance in trade and the current account since the 70s. And, and the reason we have it, and I'll get into this more, I hope, during our discussion, it's because of the government. And to determine the balance of trade, all you have to look at is the difference, the savings and investment identity. And if you're saving less than you're investing, you will have a savings deficiency and you will have a trade deficit that equals the deficiency in, in national savings. And that's what we've had since the 1970s. Now, where does this come from? You have to disaggregate the private sector and the public sector, both the state and local governments, as well as the federal government, and, and bang, what do you find out? So savings and investment identity, by definition, has to balance, and, and it does if you look empirically at the, at the data. And it turns out that the federal deficit that we run, the fiscal deficit, is just about equal to the deficit that we run on our trade and current account balance. So the source of, the pro of, of that particular problem it is the federal budget. If, if we balance the federal budget, the overall savings investment identity would, would be balanced and we would have a trade balance that was, that was more or less in, in balance. And I, I think a great deal of the political debate would and attitudes towards trade would change dramatically if that was the case. So that that ends my over two minute introduction, Caleb. But great, Th thanks, Steve. So, so David, on balance, how do you think we should handicap that economic and social impact of trade on the U.S. economy? Are there GDP statistics or employment statistics that we could put to it? And I'll also say that here in the talk curriculum, every first year student reads the book, The Choice, and it discusses a world without trade, which is play, uh, painted pretty bleakly. What do you view as the big benefits of trade, David? Okay, so I think this, this straw man of a world without trade is just irrelevant. Uh, we're not talking about a world without trade. Uh, we're talking about trade policy at the margin uh, and how we adjust to you know, globalization forces, not whether we pull the plug on the rest of the planet. Uh, and uh, it would be disastrous. Uh, it would be a terrible thing to do. Uh, it, you know, we're highly integrated with the rest of the world. We would be poor, the rest of the world would be poorer. Uh, it's, not under, it's not under serious consideration by anyone uh, for, uh, at a policy level and, and you know, government or any political party that I know of, uh, even the insane political parties that are currently uh, in our government. So I, I don't think that's the relevant question. 
uh, the, the, you know, I don't mean to be uh, dismissive, uh, and it's not, I'm not dismissive to you, I'm dismissive, <laughs> this, this is the premise of the book that I find a bit, um, you know, off-putting. I, I think the question is, um, you know, what we want, we should be asking ourselves is, uh, how do we manage the changing tide of global economic growth and productivity and its implications for our domestic economy. And uh, as I said, trade itself is, uh, should not be villainized. There are many, many good things that come from it. And I, I'm, the trade deficit actually is not my primary concern either. The trade deficit is, it matters because it affects the allocation of activity between manufacturing and non-manufacturing, but it's, it's not first order. However, very, very rapid changes in economic conditions as come about through trade can be highly, highly disruptive. Um, it's not the only thing that can be highly disruptive, right? Technol technological change can be highly disruptive. You know, uh, recessions can be highly re disruptive, but we should be prepared for all of them, uh, meaning that we should have some social protections. And I don't, when I mean protections, I don't mean trade doesn't happen. I mean adjustment mechanisms that we as use to assist individuals and communities to recover from those shocks. It's, if we're going to get the gains, which we should want to do, uh, we should uh, expect that you know, the some of our fellow citizens are gonna be heavily disadvantaged by that. Uh, it's going to create a, a lot of concentrated pain and you can say, well, we can just ignore that. You know, that's not, you know, no one promised you when you're born to this country that you, know, you have lifetime income and employment and so on. But in fact, we can't ignore it because it has very substantial political consequences. And uh, research I've done with uh, my co-authors, David Dorn and Gordon Hansen, and Kaveh Majlasi, show that this appears to have been a factor in both the rise of the Tea Party and the Trump uh, victory. Uh, areas that were heavily impacted by the China trade shock, uh, there was a lot of uh, political dissatisfaction and polarization that accompanied the economic dislocation. So uh, I think we, there's no turning back the clock on where we are. And the trade issues we're going to face going forward are actually quite different from the ones we faced over the last 20 years. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I don't think the question is whether we, you know, pull the circuit, you know, or not even, you know, pull the, you know, just pull the plug on trade. I don't think that's, that's under, should be under discussion. Uh, the question is whether we want to have the point of view that, you know, free trade, you know, uh, you know, whatever you do, free trade, uh, no, you know, full stop versus uh, we should discuss how we manage trade policy in a way that uh, you know, distributes the benefits uh, and uh, you know, kind of uh, cushions some of the costs. So Steve, what do you think about some of these disruptions that David was bringing up from trade? Or it's like, do you more view the benefits as so high on the margin that maybe there's gonna be disruptions, but we don't need to have the adjustment mechanisms that David was alluding to? Well, uh, Caleb, just a couple of comments there. Uh, in, in terms of disruptions due to technology, to, to put the thing into context and ultimately get down to the politics and political economy of the thing, you, you have to think of what, what has been the biggest disruption in the labor force in the United States since the Great Depression due, due to technology, either physical or, or biological? Well, it's in the agricultural sector. And in 1929, uh, we, we had employed in the labor force uh, about 10 and a half million people in agriculture. Now, now they're uh, less than two and a half million. The proportion of the total labor market that was taken up by agriculture in 29 was 21%. Now it's 1.6%. So you've had an absolute decline in the number of people uh, working in agriculture on, on the farm of 77 and a half percent over that period of time. And if you look at the output, by the way, it's 15 adjusted in, in constant prices, it's 15 times higher than it was in 1929. So there you've had uh, a tremendous disruption and, and of course you have an overlay of all kinds of policies that are focused on, shall we say, uh, protecting the so-called family farm, if you will. So that, that's, that's one general comment. 
that I think we should be thinking about when we're talking about displacements and disruptions. The other thing is back to this, uh, I, by the way, I do agree with David about the, the proposition of you know no, no trade and autarky is kind of an absurd thing, I, hardly worth fooling around with. So we, we completely agree with that. Uh, but look, I do think the overall trade balance, David, it is important because it, it sets the tone for a lot, a lot of what I, I would consider the, the more populist nutty policies with regard to trade and, and even the policies that aren't particularly nutty. For example, if you look at Japan, now we, we, were, we were bashing Japan, remember, for in the 80s when, when I was on President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors, that, that was the big thing. The enemy was Japan. And we had an overall trade balance that was inflaming the general thing, but it was gas was put on the fire because Japan's portion, their bilateral trade deficit, our bilateral trade deficit with Japan was 55% in 1980 when Reagan took office for the first term. And by 1990, it was 59%. Now, all of that is switched and, and China is the, is the bad guy. And, and now the current bilateral deficit filled in by Japan is, is 10% and, and uh, we've got, well, China just roughly looking at the thing, they're, they're more or less 50%, more, more or less China has replaced Japan in terms of filling that bilateral trade deficit. So, who supplies the deficit and who fills in the deficit uh, will be determined by all sorts of things, but the deficit itself is made in the USA. The USA, we are making that with the savings deficiency that we have. Now, let's look at the policy with Japan. What, what, what did we do? Uh, in 1970, 1971 to be exact, the exchange rate for the, the yen dollar exchange rate was 360. And, and the US took a position, they, they, they forced Japan, they arm twisted Japan into what I call an ever appreciating yen policy. Because the idea was that if you have the nominal exchange rate appreciating, the appreciator will lose market share and, and be less and less competitive. Well, it didn't work out that way. As I, as I said, 1971, the exchange rate was 360 yen to the dollar. By 1995, the thing had appreciated to 80 to the dollar, massive appreciation in the yen. But their share of the US trade deficit, filling in that deficit, actually increased considerably over that period of time. Then you, you had Reagan, and, and, and my, my experience was one of the Council of Economic Advisors was exactly on track with Reagan's rhetoric, and that is free trade. He, he was a free trader. Well, he wasn't a free trader, in fact. By the time the dust settled and, and all the political fights between Treasury Council of Economic Advisors and OMB on one side and the Department of Commerce and, and all the other political apparatus on the other side, the free traders lost and we lost big time. Reagan imposed quotas, voluntary quotas, particularly on automobiles to Japan. And that was of course a, a very good deal for Japan because the total number of automobiles was set on the quota and so they just put the expensive models in where they had high profit margins. And uh, thank you, <laughs> President Reagan. They, they did very well with that particular policy. It wasn't such a great deal for American consumers. Uh, in 75, I, I did a, a study when I was at the council, uh, right after I left the council. In 1975, 8% of the items that were imported in the United States were subject to either tariffs or quotas. 
by 1984, right after Reagan's first term, that had increased to 21%. So the lesson here is there's usually a lot of difference between rhetoric and reality. That's 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 the that's the big thing. So if you have a big trade deficit that's caused by the US, that will inflame the protectionist. If you have a very high concentration of that deficit being filled in by one particular country like Japan in the 80s and 90s, and now China, that will inflame the thing. And, and, and then we get to, yes, there are real impacts and, and, and dislocations that occur. And, and we can, I, I think I've burned up quite a bit of time right now. I, we, we can discuss that and, and my views about what we should do, but I think we should move maybe on to the next phase of the questioning, Caleb. Yeah, yeah, David, uh, Steve brought up China. You've done a lot of research dating back to your 2013 paper on China and the related China shock. Can you sort of walk us through what your research said? You alluded to some of it in your opening comments and how do you think about trade with China and what is the right way that maybe we should think about it going forward? Well, you know, China's, uh, you know, China's rise is, is, is unprecedented uh, in, you know, kind of uh, any, any, you know, in modern history for sure. Uh, because uh, it is one of the world's largest, uh, most populous, uh, I guess it's the world's most populous country. And it went from a state of kind of continual economic backwardness and calamity uh, under uh, Mao Zedong to a period of very rapid uh, opening and productivity growth uh, led by Deng Xiaoping uh, from the 1980s forward. And this allowed China to make a massive leap uh, into as a as a highly productive modern economy, and uh, that would not have been particularly impactful for the global trading system if China were the size of Vietnam or you know uh, you know or uh, even Korea. Um, however, because of China's incredible latent capacity of uh, land uh, resources. Uh, access to water, and of course, lots and lots of people, hundreds of millions who migrated uh, out of uh, low productive, productive rural ag agriculture, many of them well-educated, um, it was able to go from basically producing about one quarter of 1% of world manufacturing output uh, in 1989 to about 20% at present. And that was highly, highly disruptive. Now, that's not problematic. There's nothing wrong with that. What's amazing is not what China is doing now. It's amazing how backward it was and how it got so fast from where, from its latent potential to its realized potential. Um, that, uh, but that was really, uh, you know, much, but highly impactful for the countries that produce goods that China uh, displaced. And its, uh, its growth uh, was in labor intensive, uh, fairly low tech manufacturing, uh, you know, initially in, you know, in textiles, in rubber products, in commodity furniture, in assembly of toys and dolls, in lots of low end hardware. And it penetrated those markets and the US uh, had a lot of employment in those areas. And it was really, uh, we felt it much more than anyone, as far as we can tell, felt the China, the tr Japan trade shock at the time, because Japan was a much more developed country. It was not uh, competing in the same set of goods at much lower prices. Um, and, uh, and so there's a reason that we're, you know, we've had a trade deficit. There's a reason that we're talking about China rather than the trade deficit per se, which is that really was a big change. And it was accelerated by China's accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001, which was, you know, fostered by the Clinton administration, although, uh, you know, and um, and uh, and that set of actions uh, led to this incredible surge. We could talk more about that surge, but sorry, let me. I should wrap up. So, what did we learn? So, what we did was we connected that to the places that produce the things that China's comparative advantage rose in. Where China became more productive, we can see that because its exports of those goods rise to all high-income countries simultaneously. So we know it's becoming cheaper, more productive, higher-quality goods. We identify the locations in the United States where those competing goods are produced. 
Those are manufacturing intensive communities. They're very localized. And then what we can see what happens. We know that you know, it has to be true, and it is true, that manufacturing employment declines in those areas. They can't, we're not you know, consuming 10 times as many tennis shoes, right? When we start importing them, we stop producing them. Uh, and then we can ask what happened to the, uh, lo those areas and those people. Did they move readily into non-manufacturing? Did their incomes go up? Did they move elsewhere and so on? And to a remarkable extent, the, it was just like a local you know, uh, bomb going off. People did not move into non-manufacturing. They did not stay in the labor force. We saw a big rise in benefits dependency in uh, non-employment rates, uh, in household dissolution, even in deaths of despair. I don't mean to over-dramatize, but these were, uh, there's nothing special about trade here. Uh, it's just about the effect of large scale localized economic shocks and how disruptive they are. The agricultural shock, could potentially have, you know, so again, it's not special to trade except how fast acting it is. I would have the same feelings about a major technological shock or even the COVID pandemic, which the government actually did step in uh, to do something about. It was our inaction in the face of this massive change uh, that was uh, so consequential. Steve, what do you think about that briefly? Well, the, the um... Uh, no, number one, I, uh, David's work, I, I have to commend him uh, for his pioneering work in this field because it, it, it is definitive. Uh, and, and the reason I say that isn't because I'm an expert in this field. I have no pretense that I, I'm a labor economist or really know, know much about the field. But there's a, there's a little trick you, you learn in economics, and that is, when the council, President's Council of Economic Advisors is, is utilizing research, it, it is very carefully vetted, no matter what administration, it's at a high professional level. And, and I can tell you, I, if you look in the, this issue, the current issue of the President's Council, you'll find David's work uh, uh, in, in, sprinkled throughout the chapter on international trade. So, so this, this impact occurs, that, that is the cutting edge work and definitive work on it. And the question is, well, what do you do about it? And, and if you step back and think about it, it, it's a kind of a complicated problem because it creates an externality, these, these local effects, disruptive effects. And, and it's the same as, let's say you have a gas station on one corner and, and all of a sudden I decide I'm gonna build a, a, a competitive gas station on another corner of the street. Well, what's that do? I, I take business away from the pre-existing or, or the old gas station, uh, the, the value and price of his gas station goes down. And that's, what, that's what's called a pecuniary externality. It has, a, it has an effect, there's no question about it. It, it changes the price of, of the asset that the old uh, gasoline owner uh, had, had, had rights to. But then the, then the question becomes, well, uh, the buyers of uh, the gasoline, they, 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 they benefit, the new seller of gasoline benefits. And the economic conclusion from that kind of activity or that kind of disruption where you have these pecuniary externalities is that you don't do anything about it. It's so-called Pareto optimal. No, we can get out in the weeds or there are many conditions associated with that conclusion that I just gave you. But in general, pecuniary externalities should don't affect economic efficiency and, and shouldn't be uh, affecting uh, economic policy unless there's some redistributional aspect that causes you to want to uh, protect or essentially give people rights uh, that were there before the gasoline station before, maybe he will be able to effectively lobby and get a zoning uh, a change made so that I can't compete and I can't build my gas station. 
and and in fact that happens if you look at things like Walmart. Uh, there there are many zoning restrictions that, that locals put in place to protect the local uh, value of businesses that would be negatively impacted in a pecuniary way if Walmart was established in, in some locale. Now, the other kinds of externalities are called real externalities or technical externalities, and, and, and they have real impacts. And, and there, there are economic efficiency reasons for why if you're uh, if trying to bait pollution, you, you put in pollution charges, for example. Or, or you might put in some regulation, or you might change the property rights and have kind of a cosian solution to establish property rights. And, and in that case, if I want to pollute, I, I've got to bargain with whoever owns a, the, the, the air rights that I'm going to be infringing on, and, and I've got to pay something for the right to uh, burn my leaves or pollute or whatever I'm doing. So, so this gets in into really politics, it, it, uh, and, and that is the pecuniary externality is the, is the area where most economists would say, you know, you shouldn't be compensating. So it's David, a like you it's an externality, but it's a, it's a pecuniary externality, and you shut down essentially the whole competitive apparatus of the country because it's it's just not trade what about walmart what about amazon what what, what about what about the gas, new gas station that wants to move in across from the old one all of those things involve disruptions changes in prices and they are pecuniary in nature not not real or technological so, so, David, it seemed like you had your hand up that you want to respond to something. Yeah, I, I, I want to disagree on two accounts. First, the fact that I'm in the Trump administration's council uh, state of the uh, state of the American economy report should not be taken as evidence of the quality of my work. Uh, Peter Navarro had a bizarre obsession with my work uh, and would cite it for things that were not in it. Uh, and well, for all he, I know, no, uh, no, that's David, a, David, he was not on the Council of Economic Advisors. Okay. In fact, they kept him at at a thousand miles away from the okay. council. Okay, good. So maybe I don't know. I haven't, I haven't checked. But anyway, don't. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, that was a backhand way of deflecting yeah, the compliment. We, we, no one would hold that against you for sure, it, knowing how the council works and so forth. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but also, I want to disagree on this this point about the nature of the transaction. So uh, the reason, and maybe this is going too far into the weeds, but the reason pecuniary externalities are ignorable in, in a Pareto efficient equilibrium is that they are second order because we're already an interior solution. So basically the envelope theorem says they don't matter. And any transactions that occur around that uh, Pareto efficient equilibrium are Pareto improving. Uh, but trade is not Pareto improving. Pareto improving means everyone makes everyone, uh, you know, no one worse off and at least one person better off. And that is not what trade does. And this is also well known, and this is the Rybczynski theorem and the Stolper-Samuelson uh, theorem, and it is not akin to a pecuniary externality. So I don't think that that is the right analogy. I agree that it is super, it is highly dangerous to try to limit market transactions because someone could get hurt because markets are not Pareto improving in general. They they increase efficiency, but they create winners and losers. Um, and I'm not advocating for stopping trade, just like, a, you know, a, the analogy about the gas station and so on. I, I agree, that's a, like a terrible way to go. Um, I think we need to, what we should not uh, do is convince ourselves that there are no costs, that there are no losers, and that there's no, no policy that is needed to adapt to these changes. That's like, you know, you could have said in the pandemic, well, look, you know, no one had the property right to a job and economic security and, you know, st stuff happens and, you know, grow up everybody. But instead we said, well, actually what we're going to do is we're going to take 10% of GDP and distribute it to, you know, households and businesses and unemployed and even people who previously wouldn't have been unemployed are considered unemployed, excuse me. And, and that was, you know, in my opinion, although others could disagree, a worthy economic policy. It, you know, it buffered the blow and it actually helped us recover more rapidly. 
Uh, so I would argue it was less expensive to take that action than to not take that action. And I actually think, as I said earlier, we've been trying for globalization on the cheap. We've not been taking the actions that would help us adapt successfully and help people who are, you know, we are getting a lot of the aggregate gains. Prices are lower. A variety of goods is higher. There's a lot of benefits, but there are definitely people who are made worse off in a non-Pareto improving way, although that's redundant. Uh, and we're paying a price for that. Uh, we're paying a political price for that. And we should, we're also, you know, I would say we're paying a moral price for that, for the failure of, you know, caring for, you know, for neglecting the welfare of our fellow citizens who are harmed in the process of creating aggregate benefits. Uh, why is that a good policy? I want to, um... let me, let me ask David a question since he is, is the expert on this. What, what's, what's, and, and doing your analysis, what, what's the difference between Walmart and China? Uh, I mean, from a policy point of view, how, how do you deal, if, in other words, if, if you go down the, the path that you suggested, uh, then, then why can't or shouldn't you be going down that same path with uh, Walmart or Amazon, or uh, even though they're not they're not foreign entities. Obviously. But but which path are we speaking of, right? I'm not well, trying to close down Walmart, and I'm not trying to close down China. <laughs> no, I I didn't You're say saying, that you were. I, I didn't say that you were. Right. David. No, but I mean, I was, it, I'm sorry, I'm apologizing. If, if, if uh, I, I'm trying to understand, okay, you you have a lot of disruption, and you've measured it, and 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 so forth, and. And and I and I agree. It's it's true. There's no question about it. I mean, among other th other things, I, I know what disruption is because I, I'm a farm boy from Iowa, and I, and I I know in, in the 65 years since since I left Iowa, uh, it, you know, it, it's totally changed. Even in, even under under my eyes. I mean, I gave those statistics at the beginning, but you know, you you used to have three or four hired men on the farm and, and now you got you got the owner of the thing running a huge computerized combine and computers all over the place, no hired men at all, et cetera, et cetera. So so it's there's a lot of disruption and, and you have disruption even in these smaller rural areas of things like Walmart, tremendous disruption. So so what uh, what what do you do? I mean, there is disruption. So what, what what do you do to mitigate the the disruption? That that's that's my question, I guess, in simple sure. terms. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great great question. Uh, you know, I would say that you know we have a lot of social insurance policies that are directed at assisting people, but not as many as many other countries to which we compare ourselves. So we do not have a we we spend 0.3 percent of uh, GDP on what are called active labor market programs, or basically programs to assist people who lose jobs to find reemployment. Uh, you know, Denmark spends three percent of GDP. Uh, Denmark, and I'm not saying we should be Denmark, but I'm making the point: Denmark is not one of those you know sclerotic European welfare states where no one ever loses a job and everyone has security for life, but they hardly work. Denmark has more hiring and firing than the United States does per capita. They have no employment security. Uh, what they have is the expectation that they will be reemployed and the state is involved in retraining and activating people. Um, we, you know, so what could we do? We could invest more in assisting workers displaced by technology or by trade or other forces, as we do very selectively. What's crazy, right, is we have policies that help people depending on which economic force affected them. You know, we have trade adjustment assistance, which isn't a very good program, although it's not a terrible program, it's better than no program. We don't have technology adjustment assistance. I'm not really concerned about which was the economic missile that took you down, right? I'm concerned about, you know, how do we, you know, what is a, what is an, you know, a, a, an effective and reasonable way to assist fellow citizens? Um, and, and so, yeah, my, 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 I mean, we can, I do have thoughts about trade policy specifically. So I don't want to say that I'm totally disarming on that point, but I, most of the policy things that are needed are domestic policies that have to do with social insurance and investment. Uh, and that would be true whether a company was what, you know, a town was affected by 
uh, a change in you know the way things are made or a change in where they're made. So I, I, I hate to cut this off because this has been a, a, a great discussion, um, but we want to transition and get the audience involved in this one um, and, and hear what you guys have to say. So please um, feel free to either just raise your little virtual Joe, yellow hand. Joe, um, Joe, may I ask David one more question? And that is, uh, what are the, have there been any good benefit cost studies on these targeted programs? Because I, I, I'm very skeptical about, you know, implementing things like this in the United States. But Den Denmark is one thing. But, you know, do, do we have any good handle on, on really what the, what the benefit cost picture looks like? I mean, we have one, you know, really good study on trade adjustment assistance that says it, it works. Uh, it definitely boosts people's income uh, by Ben Hyman. Um, we don't have a ton of evidence. And I agree, one needs to be careful about just sort of throwing money at social policy programs without careful evaluation. And they need to be targeted. It's not easy. There isn't like one just roll it out, everybody benefits. So I agree, we want to do it thoughtfully. Uh, and some of it could actually take the form of, you know, wage insurance that basically you don't retrain someone, you say, hey, we're going to supplement your income, you know, you, you lost a $25 an hour job, you're going to a $15 an hour job, we're going to give you five bucks an hour for the next year. To supplement your income and you can just take a lower pay job and look for a better job that's another way and that's a very effective way there's almost no efficiency cost to doing that type of transfer policy so there are things to do and i agree steve it's it's much easier to diagnose the problem than to address it and it, it uh but i do think it uh that's still better than than um the alternatives see, see yeah i think you put your finger on the the problem in the united states is when, whenever washington sees a problem they grab the checkbook so let, Without, yeah, let's, let's go back to Joe to. Yeah, just, just wanted to make sure we, we get a few, uh, uh, a few audience questions in here. Um, uh, Rob, you mentioned um, you had something to ask. Did, did you want to just uh, sure. shout it out yeah. here? Um, hi, David. Um, I, uh, I used to work for a, a U.S. Senator, and I can tell you that um, your, your work was not only cited by Donald Trump, but also Senate Democrats. Um, and and, you, and your, your name is widely known amongst, amongst them as well. And I think a lot of what uh, you are talking about is what Senate Democrats are working with uh, President Biden on with regards to this human capital program in a potential infrastructure um, bill. Uh, I was wondering you know, what, what your thoughts are on that. And if you, know, you think that TAA and, and programs like it should be completely replaced uh, by some you know, larger um, retraining program and, and, and maybe, you know, a combination of wage replacement, something like that. Uh, I was wondering what broadly your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, we have a patchwork of programs and trade adjustment assistance is not that easy to access. And it's also very restrictive in the sense that you have to go and go spend a year or two in school as when maybe the thing you need is just to take a different job with a little bit of financial support. So I don't think it's a very, uh, you know, it's, it's not a well, calibrated program and it doesn't deal with a lot of the disruptions that we're going to have. But I, you know, I, but more broadly, some of this is about, you know, social, you know, kind of assistance programs, but some of it is about reinvestment, right? The U.S. has, you know, over the last four decades made the decision to, you know, run a very uh, low cost federal government and do a lot less investment in people and in infrastructure. And, and that may have been a good policy for a while. Um, but it's possible that we've actually gone too far with that and that we've allowed, at least in my opinion, obviously I'm saying, you know, uh, extremes of inequality and underinvestment in infrastructure and in skills and opportunity that actually are, you know, leading to extremes that are hinder political action, that prevent people from realizing their potential, that, you know, actually prevent a lot of good opportunities. So, uh, and even from, from economic mobility. I think the issues of trade would seem much, much less salient if things were actually working better for, you know, more broadly in the labor market, you know, the, the China trade shock started in the 90s and nobody noticed. <laughs> it was only in the 2000s when the U.S. economy was otherwise weak and China joined WO, that's when it really hit home. And so uh, if the context was one where we had tight labor markets and a ton of investment uh, and there was growing opportunity in other sectors, 
I think people would be a lot more sanguine about this. So it's not just about insulating after the fact. It's actually about reinvigorating uh, and you know rebuilding some of the other capacities that the U.S. economy has had in the past. Um, so I think we can. Uh, a lot of the issues that trade highlights for us are not going to be resolved by trade policy. Um, Stelianos, you mentioned you yeah, had a I, question. Just yeah, could I could I make a just a brief? Yeah, comment? please. Yeah. The, for, first of all, uh, David keeps talking about China and the Chinese shock. The Japanese shock was exactly the same thing, and the magnitudes were all exactly the same. And, and most of the debate in the 1980s with Japan were essentially the same as what, what we have now with China. And, and again, let me point out, if that, a lot of that could have been shut down if we would have been running a, a balanced trade account. Now, I, I, I think that a balanced trade account is, is not a target that we should be shooting for. I, I th I'm totally against that. I'm just saying that it is caused by our savings deficiency and it inflames things. And, and then if you have a big player like Japan in the 80s or China now, that inflames it further and creates problems. But the, the, the little point that I wanted to make uh, about the programs that, that David's talking about, in my judgment, there, there are no ex post evaluations that have been done on these things to say, oh, that, that's a great idea. We, we, we started a program and, and it was supposed to mitigate these disruptions and damages associated with them. How did it work? There, there, we, the, the federal government does no ex post benefit cost analyses. And, and, and most of the ex ante benefit cost analyses they, they've done, by the way, on infrastructure have been phony as a, a $3 bill, but there are almost no ex post evaluations. It's not like a private business where a private business decides, oh, we're gonna invest in something. We're gonna allocate capital this way. And, and we know if they did the right thing or not, because we've got the income statement the year after, the second year after and so forth. You don't have that with the government. So I would say we know almost nothing about how effective these programs have been. Now, I, I could be wrong on that. David certainly knows the literature better than I would, but. I'm, I, I'm, I, all I'm, fair. I'm yeah. with you, Steve, completely that we, evaluation is critical and we should not be conducting uh, uncontrolled policy experiments. And we yeah. should be investing in, and there is a real movement in economics to do exactly that, right? To do randomized evaluations of policies of this sort. And, uh, you know, sometimes they're ready, they're you know, shovel ready when the, uh, when the time comes and sometimes they're not. We got to invest prospectively so we know what to do uh, when we need it. I think we have time for one more question. And uh, Stelianos, you said you had something to ask. Feel free to chime in. Yeah, so uh, thanks so much, David and Steve. Uh, it's a very good question. I was just wondering, China has the great firewall um, that doesn't permit Amazon, Facebook, and another, another, a number of other tech companies. And that helped China develop their own companies domestically. And now China is leading the AI revolution. So my question is, from the point of view of China, do you think that trade protection helped the, the local economy instead of harming it? Um, you know, I think what China does is, is much, much more complicated than trade protection. Uh, and I think they've been strategic about it. And I think it's worked well for them in many ways. Although at this point, I think China is actually, uh, you know, kind of a little bit killing the golden goose or possibly doing so. Actually, more of resources are being given to state-owned enterprises and taken away from private enterprise. And of course, private enterprises, you know, ask Jack Ma, right, uh, feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now, or ask people in Hong Kong. Um, however, what China has done very successfully, they, they've attracted an enormous amount of foreign investment. They've used their savings uh, for uh, a lot of domestic investment. And then, of course, they have strategically, uh, you know, obtained intellectual property through partnerships uh, and through with the reward of market access. So a lot of what they have done is a violation of WTO rules, uh, but it's hard to enforce. Um, I do think the challenge of China trade at this point is much more than about, you know, 
you know, uh, you know, textiles and, and dolls and furniture and much more about control of frontier sectors, you know, telecoms, um, you know, semiconductors, uh, aircraft, uh, you know, power generation, electric vehicles. And I think it, it, it's a different type of problem. It's not really a trade policy problem anymore. It's kind of a great powers challenge. And I think it needs to be managed very thoughtfully. I'm not advocating for a second Cold War. Uh, but I think we're naive to think that, you know, it's sufficiently described by textbook economics of any sort. <laughs> it's, it's much more uh, nuanced than that. So uh, China has done many great things for its people and uh, create a lot of prosperity. Uh, but there are, uh, you know, significant challenges that go way beyond control of commodity uh, products at this point. Yeah, let me, let me add something there. Uh, I, and that is with regard, and this complements what David's saying. This is an area I know a lot about because I'm actually the chairman of the supervisory board of a, the Advanced Metallurgical Group. And, and, and this is metallurgy, mining metals and so forth. And if you look at something like rare earths, uh, which uh, you've probably seen in the press, these are these are critical materials that, that are needed for in the defense industry as, as well as uh, uh, re reduction of CO2 uh, and all, all, all of the rest of the green technology. Now, that wasn't because of restrictions. That was strategic investment. The Chinese have virtually no universities in, in the top tier, the top 100 of, any, of anything in any field, except mining, metallurgy, and material science. They dominate. So they, 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 have, they have the intellectual horsepower and, and, and they have a lot of the raw material. I mean, the, 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 actually the, the, the rare earths themselves. But the processing of those is very tricky, and the and the Chinese dominate because they dominate in at the university level. How many mining schools are even left in the United States? Almost none. Actually, Columbia University, an Ivy League school, used to have a mining school. It was a good one. They don't they don't anymore. But so so they. This this is, has nothing to do with protection per se. In other words, it's it's not like the the, the, the proposition that oh they they have protection the infinite industry kind of argument. No, they decided they were going to after 1979 when Deng made his announcement that they were going to ba basically become capitalistic. They realized they were going to have to build a lot of infrastructure, use a lot of materials, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they invested in the intellectual horsepower they need to do it. Well, great. I know we're, we're three minutes past the hour, so uh, like wrap up, uh, but thanks so much uh, to you both, David and Steve, for, for joining us tonight and, and providing your views. This has been a um, super fascinating event and thanks everyone else for attending on a nice um, sunny Wednesday evening. So, Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks, Steve. That was really a pleasure to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, David. <laughs>